Warning, I say a lot of bad words. If you're under 13, you probably shouldn't be watching this. This is worthless. Battle in Wonderworld is an interactive torture method that was deemed cruel and unusual punishment and subsequently banned by the Geneva Convention. Well, not really. It's just a bad game and I'm exaggerating how bad I think it is for the sake of a joke. Laugh or perish in the fires of hell. This game kinda... happened? I remember one day there was something that popped in my Twitter feed about this Balan Wonderworld game that was apparently happening, and I thought it looked decent enough at the time, though to be honest I wasn't really all that super excited about this game upon first reveal. I mean, I thought it looked cool and I probably would have gone out to snag a copy of this game if it turned out any good, but I didn't really have much more than mild interest in this game before launch. Balan was initially supposed to be a spiritual successor to Sega's Knights franchise, headed by Yuji Naka, the former head of Sonic Team, with some input from Naoto Oshima, the original character designer for Sonic the Hedgehog. This game was developed by Arzest, who you may know for a resume of games with at least decent reception, and hey Pikmin, and published by Square Enix, who I guess are just contractually obligated to embarrass themselves in public at least once every year now. I've already covered a couple of those incidents in the past. I know Balan Wonderworld has already been beaten into the ground by people who actually made the poor decision of buying this garbage at full price instead of waiting, like, a week for it to drop, but that's never stopped me in the past. Also, I was not gonna waste $60 on a game that I heard nothing but bad things about. I work in retail, I don't have that kind of money to just throw away, okay? I played this game, had a pretty miserable time overall, and I'm gonna complain about it and make fun of it for the entertainment of every last one of you. Okay, so before we actually begin this video, I feel like I need to address some news that recently came to light surrounding Balan Wonderworld specifically between Yuji Naka and Square Enix. Essentially, Naka was booted out of the project about six or so months before the game was set to come out, and Naka filed a lawsuit against Square Enix for his sudden termination. This only recently became public knowledge because a gag order was in effect until now. There's a lot to go into with this whole situation, and I'd rather not go on too long about it and take focus away from analyzing the game itself. Personally, I'm not too sure how to feel about this. Square definitely did Naka dirty, and that along with how they've treated other big creators over the years paints them in a very scummy light, but Naka's testimony is also kinda questionable. It wasn't only executives at Square that wanted him out, but a lot of people on the actual development team and even the human resources department, which Naka himself admitted. That leads me to believe there was a lot more going on behind the scenes than Naka or anyone else has told us about, especially if documented cases of Naka's less than ideal behavior working at Sega are any indicator. As much as Naka's pointing the finger at Square for how much of a mess Balan Wonderworld turned out, this seems more like an instance of shared blame than anything. Again, this whole situation resulted in a lawsuit, so there at least has to be some ground for a case against Square Enix. I could be wrong about literally everything I just said right now, I'm not a lawyer, but that's kind of what I took away from this whole thing. And given where the game's major problems actually lie, I don't really think those six months of development time would have been enough to salvage this project, even with Naka still on board. I immediately got a not-so-great first impression from this game just at the start menu. I played this on PC while using a controller, and I kept having this issue where pressing up or down on the D-pad caused me to scroll past two different options. Essentially, using the D-pad would cycle through every other option, and I basically had to use the analog stick very lightly to actually get it to work properly. If something as innocuous as a pause or start menu doesn't function properly for me, I'm very scared. You're given the option of choosing between either a male or female protagonist, assuming your menu works the way it's fucking supposed to, look at this! I am girl, so I went with girl. Emma Cole is her name, I guess. Upon starting, this girl is in some orphanage or convent or something, the game doesn't really explain that or why all the other girls are avoiding her. My best guess is that it's because she's dressed reasonably like how a regular girl would dress, while they're all dressed like maids. Ew, who got her that denim jacket? Her grandma? She then runs off and is led into an alleyway, bad sign, where she comes across some theater run by some guy whose introduction seems a lot more sinister than I imagined was intended. Yes? Yeah. <laughs> I've never felt more tempted to report a fictional character to the FBI than I feel right now. I'm not very comfortable, please stop. Afterwards, I... honestly couldn't tell you what's happening. 
I don't usually like to say, the people making such and such game must have been high on something whenever somebody does some weird shit, but then I see this entire... montage unfold? And that's all I can think of for how this came into existence. Then he kidnaps you and immediately drops you into this weird fantasy world that the game doesn't even attempt to catch you up on. And because there's not much else you can do at the moment, you hop into some level with a barnyard theme. Hey folks, viewer mail time again! I wish. It takes until you get to the first boss for the game to actually give you anything resembling a story. It's revealed that this farmer guy had his farm and crops absolutely wrecked by a tornado, and he's very upsetty spaghetti about the ordeal. I guess after you beat the boss, his conflict is somehow resolved, because there's an out-of-nowhere dance sequence, and the farmer doesn't feel the big sad anymore. Dance party endings are always a sign of great things to come, I guess. Okay, being real, I have no fucking clue what's going on here. This game is so stingy about conveying anything that's going on, and it gives you nothing to piece any semblance of a story together with. Like, why am I here? Who am I? Who is this Balan bitch? Who are any of these people? Why do I have to help them? What's the significance of this train that I keep seeing everywhere? The answer to all those questions and many more are never told to you. At all. The only thing that's really evident here is that there's a bunch of people going through some emotional stuff, and you have to go through their specific level and defeat the boss in it to help them overcome the thing troubling them. There's a big difference between being intentionally vague for the intent of ambiguity and encouraging different interpretations of your work, and just omitting vital information that your story desperately needs. You can probably guess which one of these Balan Wonderworld is. It's so hard for me to properly critique this game's plot because it just about doesn't have one. I know it's a 3D platformer, and I don't have super high expectations for stories in said genre, but even the most basic run-of-the-mill 3D platformer stories at least let you know what you're doing and why you're doing it. It doesn't even feel appropriate calling any of this game's massive cast characters because they have no character to speak of. All the people you help out are one basic archetype with nothing else that actually fleshes them out. Examples include Farmer and Diver and Bug Girl and Inventor and Firefighter and Artist. I swear, that's exactly how one-dimensional every one of these characters are. It feels more appropriate to call them pedestrians or background extras or something else that conveys about as little importance, and really the levels you visit could have helped a lot with actually fleshing these people out. Psychonauts did the same thing and pulled it off really well, letting us know more about the characters in question by diving into their psyche, learning about their history and what's troubling them mentally. But this game doesn't do that. The levels are just based around a surface level theme that doesn't tell us anything meaningful about the characters we're trying to help out. You just see a large version of their character model occasionally darted throughout the level. The game doesn't even tell you what any of these characters are sad about until you get to the boss at the end, so you're just wandering around most of the substantial parts of the game completely uninvested. Shouldn't these cutscenes be the very first thing you see when entering a new world, not placed as close to the resolution cutscene as they could possibly be? I also can't help but find it a bit jarring how this game seems to put situations as minor as girl is sad that people find her bug hobby weird, clown is too nervous to ask out a girl he likes, old fuck loses a game of chess, and art block on the same level as much more serious stuff like farmer's way of life destroyed by a tornado, diver almost dies by drowning, and girl Girl's cat gets run over by a car. That last one just makes me angry, to be honest. I'm very sensitive when it comes to violence toward animals, especially cats, and the game just casually throwing in that scene made me so upset that I had to shut the game off for the day. And the whole situation was fixed by Balan rewinding time and making it so the cat never got run over. Because that's how you deal with emotional trauma! Rewinding time to prevent said traumatic event from ever happening in the first place! I don't even know what exactly you as the main character are doing to actually help out. Just be the boss and the characters feel better, I guess? Balan just seems to be doing a lot of the work for you as some of the cutscenes are anything to go off of. Or maybe he's just spectating? I don't know, this game doesn't tell you anything! Why are these all the characters that you're helping out? They're just random people that you have no connection to. I think this edgelord that you see everywhere is supposed to be the villain or the edgy rival to Balan or something. Honestly, I don't really care because, again, this game doesn't tell you anything. It doesn't even attempt to. This feels unfinished, or like major chunks of the story were just gutted out and never made it into the final game. It feels like there should be more to this game's story than what made it in. And that's because there is. 
Apparently, there is a Balan Wonderworld novel called Maestro of Mystery Theater of Wonders that actually explains what's going on and flushes out the absolute sacks of nothing this game calls characters. I didn't read it because I am not paying 10 extra dollars so that I can maybe understand this bad game story a little bit more. I'm also not going to talk about it here because the story in your video game should be in your video game. They had all of the story stuff and they didn't bother putting it into the actual game? What's even the logic behind that? Everyone's been ripping apart the storytelling of Destiny for years for that exact reason. If you want to see this story concept done well in a platformer, just play Psychonauts 1 and 2. This game doesn't even come close to either of them. Balan Wonderworld is a 3D platformer with some... interesting quirks. I'm really trying to be nice by saying that. The main selling points and focal points of development for this game are the various costumes you find throughout each world, and the dirt simple moveset of walk and press one button for a single action. You explore each level searching for balance statues, the main collectible of this game. You need to grab a certain number of them to... ride around on a magical train for a bit, which somehow unlocks a new set of levels to explore in the exact same area you were already in? What the fuck? If you were traveling to another hub area with new levels, I'd maybe get it, but you're only in one hub world the whole game, I don't get it. There is so much wrong with this game, both in concept and execution, I don't even know where to start. If the story of Bal and Wonderworld can be described as Discount Psychonauts, the gameplay I describe as Bootleg Super Mario Odyssey. You're exploring open-ended levels with collectibles dotted around the map, all while using a set of costumes present in each level. It's kinda sort of a similar idea to Odyssey letting you take control of enemies, and use them to your advantage. Every costume you unlock has a unique function that can be used for things like combat and puzzle solving. But here's the problem with how this mechanic is implemented. Take a guess of how many of these costumes there are. There are 80 total costumes throughout this game. 80! What the fucking fuck? Mario Odyssey has like half that number of things you can take control of. Did it not occur to Naka that 80 different costumes with 80 different character designs and 80 different gameplay gimmicks was overkill to both players and developers? Apparently that did cross his mind because he even considered cutting that number in half to 40, which honestly he should have done. Maybe even less than that. Very few if any of the costumes are given interesting or meaningful implementation in any of the levels, and who can blame the developers when they were mandated to make use of 80 of these damn things. 80 of anything is a lot for a video game, let alone potentially 80 different gimmicks to take into account. Several costumes are just carbon copies of others with minor differences that make the other ones entirely obsolete. Quite a few levels in this game are darted with dirt simple puzzles, or mechanisms because puzzle involves some kind of thought, that are only there to justify the existence of several costumes that only have a few practical uses in very specific circumstances. You can pick up any LEGO game, and I guarantee you'll find puzzles with more depth to them than in all of Balan Wonderworld. There's a plethora of costumes that basically amount to glide or hover, there's a couple that shoot projectiles on a timer when you stand still which is completely useless for what this game calls combat, a character that basically has Sonic's homing attack only it's somehow worse in this game than it is in even the shittiest 3D Sonic games, and quite possibly one of the top 5 worst power-ups in video game history, motherfucking Box Fox! This thing literally turns into a metal box at random intervals, and you can't move. Also, if you aren't standing completely still when this thing goes off, your forward momentum carries over with it, and you'll continue sliding which can send you falling off the edge of a level. There's plenty more I could list off and go into, but there's 80 of these damn things. I would rather write a 1000 page research paper on the history of bananas. Another big issue that stems from the costumes is the fact that a lot of them remove your ability to jump. Let me run this by you. Balan Wonderworld is a 3D platformer, a genre that's entirely built around jumping throughout levels, where you don't always have the ability to jump. And there's one very stupid explanation for why that's the case. For some reason I will never understand, Yuji Naka wanted Balan Wonderworld to be a game with only one major gameplay function you use, and that function is tied to multiple buttons. You are forced to use six buttons for the same function. All the face buttons and two of the shoulder buttons have the exact same function. Jumping is one such function, and you'll only be allowed to jump if the gimmick of one of the costumes permits jumping. And many of the costumes are not based around jumping, so you're just stuck on the ground while you have that costume equipped. I feel like it should be an unwritten rule that platformers need a dedicated jump function by default under any circumstance. 
that's not unreasonable, is it? Basic movement doesn't feel that good already, and playing any of the costumes that remove the ability to jump makes playing this piece of shit even more uncomfortable and monotonous. A lot of the time if you can't jump, you have to wait for slow moving platforms to line up for you to walk on and wait for. It's very tedious. Apparently Naka's reason for doing this is so that young kids wouldn't be confused or overwhelmed by having to press too many buttons. Honestly, that sounds more insulting toward your target demographic than considerate. I'm obviously not a kid anymore, but I've been playing 3D platformers since I was at least 6 or 7 years old, and I never felt confused about games having more than one button function. Can't really imagine that too many other kids would feel the same way either. This game's attempt at being simplistic just ends up backfiring, and making a game that should be simple to grasp a lot more confusing and complicated. The bloated costume roster and the simplistic to a fault game mechanics just cause everything else in this game like combat and level design to suffer as a result. They look like they should invite the player to explore and experiment with the game's mechanics, but instead that's quite the opposite. I don't think I've ever felt as restricted playing any 3D platformer as much as I have while playing Balan Wonderworld. There's no interesting challenges when it comes to platforming, likely because you don't always have the ability to fucking jump. The costumes are given the most barebones stuff to use with them, which is not surprising given that, again, there's 80 of these damn things. And combat is pretty basic, even by the standards of the genre, because you only have one function tied to multiple buttons to work with. This game is not well designed by any stretch of the imagination, but how the fuck was it supposed to be with these bizarre mandates and limitations forced onto a project that would have been a lot better without them? I'd much prefer getting to play with maybe a dozen or so different costumes that are well integrated into the levels, instead of over 80 of them that are situational at best and absolutely useless at worst. To get new costumes in a level, you need to find a key to unlock them, and keys are always, like, two feet away from costumes, so what's even the point? One of the costumes exists for the sole purpose of getting more costumes without collecting keys. Why? What's the point when keys are right there all the time? A few balance statues are unobtainable on your first visit to a level, since you'll need a certain type of costume that's unlocked in a later level. Conceptually, that's fine, as it's a nice way of encouraging replay value, but the game even manages to overcomplicate that. Each time you get a new costume, it stacks into your wardrobe inventory. Costumes also act as hit points in the game, and whenever you get hit, the costume you're currently wearing disappears forever, and you now have one less of a certain type of costume. Most of the costumes are unique to one level, and they can't be obtained anywhere else. If you're taking specific costumes to a different level, you better hope you don't lose all of them there, because the only way to get more of them is to go back to that level and collect more of them. It's so much monotonous busy work for only a small, paltry amount of all the balance statues in the game. Also, every 3D platformer, and even most 2D platformers, have done well with an attack function in addition to a jump function. I can't see many children being confused by that, and I feel like the biggest clown on Earth having to explain this out loud. I know this worked with Sonic on the Genesis, and I can see this maybe working for a 2D platformer, but a 3D platformer? Absolutely not. There's just too many things here for only one button. Probably the worst parts of this game for me were the balanced bout challenges. They're QTE sequences. I'd stop there if the problems also stop there. You press the action button whenever a transparent PNG of Balan lines up with his current pose. Depending on your timing, you either get a perfect, great, good, or oops rating. It's the same recycled sequence and animations. Every single time. It can be really irritating getting the timing down because a lot of the poses have very bad clarity, and it isn't always obvious when exactly they'll line up. You get a balance statue from these sequences if, and only if, you do perfect on each QTE. Raider Below instantly keeps you from getting a statue, which is ridiculous. If you get anything less than perfect one time, you might as well not even bother and let Balan get the shit beaten out of him in these sequences. At least that's pretty funny to watch, the dude just goes flying like he's Team Rocket or something, it's hilarious. To be fair, one idea I actually do kinda like is how the bosses work in this game. Each boss has multiple ways that it can be damaged, and you'll gain a balance statue for each unique hit you get on them. It's unironically a pretty neat idea for bosses, but even that ends up botched. You mostly just sit around waiting for the boss to open up for specific attack opportunities, which really drags these fights out for a while. It doesn't help that they're also just not fun because this game sucks ass to play. The most fun I had playing this game was feeding these little puffballs all the gems that I've been collecting throughout the game. 
Kinda sad to say, since it basically just consists of waiting around doing a whole lot of nothing while a number slowly goes up, but I got way more stimulation out of doing literally nothing than actually playing the damn game. I can't remember the last time I enjoyed a 3D platformer as little as I did here. I've played titles that are objectively more broken on a functionality level, this game is at least playable, I'll give it that, but the core mechanics and everything designed around them just suck the life out of me. It's unfortunate that's the case because the game's presentation isn't bad. As boring as I find the levels thematically, they certainly look pleasing to the eye. The levels are all vibrant and visually interesting depictions of their attempted themes for as basic and surface level as they are. Nothing really wowed me in terms of aesthetics, but nothing really stuck out as distractingly bad either. Well, except for this weird terrain deforming effect in the first world, that looks awful. I really dig a lot of the character designs in this game. The human NPCs and costumes all retain a similar aesthetic to the Nights into Dreams art style, while stripping away some of the uncanny realism. I can at least give the game credit for visual consistency. It's kind of depressing how a character as expressive and creatively designed as Balan is stuck in a game this terrible. The pre-rendered cutscenes look fantastic and allow the game's attempts at being whimsical to shine at least a bit more on the visual end. Though I'm really confused about why crowds of people in some shots are represented by these plain stationary models. I have no clue if that was an intentional decision, or if those were just placeholders they left in for fully animated crowds that they never actually put into the game but it's very distracting. The music's pretty good, and I remember really enjoying the tracks in the forest and ice levels especially. I don't have much to say about it, but I was not in pure agony while listening to any of the music here, so bravo. At times, though, it does feel like I've heard these songs from other games. The main menu theme, I swear, sounds eerily similar to the Olympus Coliseum music in Kingdom Hearts 1. Also, that battle theme. This game sure loves making you listen to it. You know how in Sonic Unleashed, every time you get into combat with the Werehog, you hear that jazz music? You like jazz? Yeah, that also happens in Balan Wonderworld, and it's exactly as grating here as it is there. And I don't know if this is just me, but every time the music starts up, it sounds like somebody is chanting Ballsack. I think I need to stop talking about this game now. Balan Wonderworld was 13 wasted hours of my life that I'll never get back. Part of me feels like maybe people exaggerate how bad this game actually is at least a little bit, but another part of me can't recall a single moment in this game where I actually enjoyed myself. There's ideas here that could at least make for a passable game. It's a shame these ideas are dragged down by this game's attempts to simplify everything, storytelling on the same level as vanilla Destiny, and an all-encompassing issue of prioritizing quantity over quality. I managed to get to the final boss, but by the time I did, I was so beyond fed up with this game's garbage that I just gave up and never looked back. You're all probably surprised to hear me say this, but I'd recommend not touching this game. Ever. Especially not on Switch, oh my god! I played the PC version, which in all fairness at least performed and ran well for me. Even playing the game with that in mind, this whole thing was a massive slog. I can't imagine playing this on Switch with everything I've heard about and seen of it. Balan Wonderworld looks and sounds nice, but that's only masking a game that completely falls apart even under the slightest amount of scrutiny. I need a palate cleanser after this, so I think I'll talk about Zelda some more. That sounds fun. Oh, and the new LEGO Star Wars came out. Nice! But until next time, I hope you all enjoyed the video. If you did, be sure to leave a like, comment, subscribe, and hit the bell icon to be notified about future uploads. Take care and thanks for watching. I'm out.